Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry, and I find myself once again preparing to venture into Steve Jackson's sorcery. Now, I know it's been a little bit of a while, but now the Lost Eidolons playtest is behind me, and I can focus back on the other games that I've been enjoying on the channel. Uh, I could have tried to squeeze in a few sorcery episodes, but I was trying to... To get through what about 14 15 hours of gameplay in five days and i was actually trying to get through it in four because i was um mistaken as to when the end date was so so yeah i did okay um but let's get back to this now first off i see the edge of the timescape flickering here and it's moving around a lot. I hope the Great Chasm will be here both in both timelines. I'm seeing these pillars fall and rise once again. And when I last left it, I had found myself here. The path from the mountain joins the ancient road. Night falls. You should try to gain, you try to find somewhere safe to sleep, especially after going all day without food. You stand in the foothills of the mountains. Looking east, the wide waters of Lake Ilklala gleam in the starlight. A sheltered hollow in the rocks would make a good place to stop and rest. Just to the south is a deep fissure in the land, as though something gigantic had stamped its foot and cracked the earth. I am given the option to throw the sun orb into the fissure. I have no intention of doing so. Does this change? No good, it seems to remain uh, the state it was when I arrived at the area. So when the time moves across me without me progressing time or doing anything, that seems to not change until I progress. Right, so. Oh, is this a... There's something here changing on the mountainside. Okay, it's not a tunnel entrance. Now, I have received the vision of me trying to sleep by a, a deep fissure in the earth and it cracking open as something monumental and magnificent rises from it. I have not yet encountered the earth serpent. Furthermore, if I toss the crystal ball containing the sun serpent into the chasm, the crystal or glass of a bull will shatter. And I think that would not be a good idea. Additionally, I have clues. The sun serpent is vulnerable to water. The water serpent is vulnerable to oil. However... I am also aware that the Sun Serpent and the Water Serpent yearn for one another, a deadly combination, and that they will be each other's destruction. I would like to try and keep the Sun Orb until I encounter the Water Serpent and hopefully toss it into its mouth or something, and then they can destroy one another. Also, that would happen in Lake Ilklala, which is full of water, and I would be releasing the Water Serpent the sun serpent into the water perhaps then he'd thrash around boiling and being extinguished and the water serpent would rush to his aid desperate to be with him and seal her own doom or maybe the sun serpent's female the water serpent's male i don't mind it's, it's, it's the imagery okay you know maybe they won't rush together perhaps one will be in in great need of help and the other will but yes that's the way I'm seeing it. Now, I also have the, um, I should have the scroll, shouldn't I? The scroll message. Um, Servant of time. It's a riddle. In time, all things must end at last, the back and forth of ages past. Time's great light will cast a pall, two times too many. Time will fall. Two times too many. So what's too many? 
too many serp too many times serpents would be two. Two times two is four. Can we get four beacons shining on it? I don't know. I also think I need some a little bit more information to piece together the riddle. It may be an incantation and not a riddle. So I have no intention of casting the sun orb into the fissure. I have not yet encountered the earth serpent, and if it's going to come rising up from this fissure when I sleep, yes, that could have been the sun serpent rising up, but there was no mention of light, then I would like to be here to deal with it. And I would need to get it airborne. Hence my gale horn and casting huff, um, levitation spell, other stuff. Yeah. So I could rise up and maybe tempt it up from the ground. I don't know. There are spells I can cast here. Many of which I imagine. So, I got big to make myself bigger. I could climb down into the chasm and lower the orb gently. I could float down the chasm. How? Um... That feels a bit wasteful. Uh, got full, got fourth. Make a force field across the chasm. How long am I resting for? Fog. Not particularly useful at the moment in the middle of the night when it's dark anyway. I think I should cast no spells and rest. But if I'm going to rest, I should pray for healing. There we go. I should have probably done that after resting, but if I'm liable to have a dangerous encounter in the night, I want to be in good form. You settle down on the rocks to sleep, but before you manage to make yourself comfortable, you are disturbed by a deep rumble somewhere in the earth below. I will not ignore it. In the vision I looked around without getting up, now I will get up. This is the time for action. You stand to leave and your foot dislodge a chunk of rock which rolls away towards the fissure and then abruptly it stops, reversing direction and begins to roll back towards you. I will stay still. It's only a small chunk of rock. I don't need to dodge a pebble. You stay put and the rock shoots past you, impacting from dust against an overhang. The rumbling is growing louder and an even bigger explosion is coming. Now I cast a spell. What do I cast? Foff or fall? Different. Okay. Protection from magic. Good idea. Huff. Great idea, but do I need to cast that now? I think I should wait. Walk. Another good idea. F. F off. It's an explosion that's coming, right? I don't know that I could fly away from it quickly enough in time. No wall, just walk. Ah. Uh, Huff. I want to, I really want to go for that huff, but those not wise. Mm. On the assumption that the explosion, what could be natural or magical, and that a force field would protect me from a magical explosion as well as a physical one, I'll go with that. You cast the spell, forming a shimmering force field around your body. You should be protected from all but the most serious injury now. Just in time, the rock surface explodes and you are showered with falling stones. Bring the earth serpent to me. I'll f <laughs> They bounce harmlessly off your force field, but you are knocked off your feet all the same. The ground opens up directly where you fall, forming the shape of a freshly dug grave...
you were in the bottom of a deep pit. Dust and small stones are still raining over the lip. With a pop, your force field shimmers out of existence. I'll look around, because above me is the top of the pit, right? Unless anything's coming down to get me, I don't need to look up just yet. I'll look around. The walls of the pit are smooth, not carved, as though this pit has been drilled. There is no way to climb out. I have spells. The earth below is creaking and hissing with steam. I will look up. You're about nine feet below the rim of the pit. You may be able to jump and grab the edge, but it is unlikely. Suddenly, a rocky protrusion breaks through the floor. It is glowing red. It is. It glows red. It is boiling hot. I will cast a spell. That spike looks very bad, but I think getting out of the pit would be a really good idea right now. Zen. Fall would do one thing, but Zen much better. You weave the enchantment and the medallion begins to glow as you rise gently up into the air and I will float out of the pit. You float up out of the pit which fills with burning hot rocks and lava just as you escape. And now will something rise from the chasm? You're out of the pit, but the danger is by no means past. Cracks are radiating across the ground. One opens between your feet. Why would I wait? I have my Zen spell still active, right? So, but I think I should jump clear. You jump clear just in time to avoid being swallowed. Turning, you spot a large boulder on top of the rise where you pause to rest. Teetering, dodge left. Left is best. I did dodge left before with the air serpent though, so maybe right is better this time. I'm going to go left. You prepare to dodge, but find something is holding your leg. A small green snake has wrapped itself around your ankle and is attempting to bite. Awesome, Earth Serpent. Um, shake it off. Run it through. I don't think it's going to be particularly weak in this form, and if I attempt to run it through, it will transform and reveal itself, so I'm going to try shake it off. You kick the snake away. The boulder is teetering more violently now. Run up towards the boulder. Not directly at it to get ro Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> you race up to the boulder, intending to push it in the other direction from where you stand, or rather just, like, sl off to the side. But as you heave on it, you stagger forwards into a crack in the ground that snaps shut on your leg. You howl in pain. Cast a spell. Cast a flipping spell. I think big. Big, big. Big time. I mean, summon a giant would be great if I had a giant's tooth, which I don't have anymore. I wasted it early on. Now, my leg is constricted in a tight space. If it grows in size, either my leg will be crushed or the space will shatter and widen. This may not be healthy. Consulting the constellations overhead, you bind the spell, inflating to more than twice your usual height, but it does not free you, only makes the prush crushing pain in your leg worse. Yeah, I'll pull my, I'll, could I push the boulder away? You tug and pull at your leg, but it is held fast, and you can feel your foot heating up right time to cast another spell. Zip. I see the Z. Z Zob. Unknown. One moment. And suddenly we have an interesting possibility. Let's find out. You try to bind the enchantment, but you're missing an item that it needs, and so the spell dissipates around you. Okay, fine, cast another spell. I mean, not ideal in the current circumstances. Do I feel that this is magic? Magical fire? He, no, I think it's like lava. Um, big again would be bad. So, 
Foth, no. Fog, no. These are bad. Why would I cast a lightning spell? At the ground to crack it open to free my leg? Maybe. Um, so I've got Y, Z, F, B. Big again, I'm not sure that would help. F. Force field. How's that going to help when my ground's below, my legs below the ground? Fog. I don't think making it darker is going to help. Um, and I should still be flying. Uh, y and Z. Yap. Yob. Yob would be great. So Z. Zap. Look, it's desperate enough already. Well, it's bloody hell. You spin the stars into your design around you, building up a charge of electrical energy around your palm. Then you blast the rock close by your foot. It explodes open and you snatch your leg free. Something bites at your foot. It is the snake. It has come for you again. But then suddenly it begins to grow. And this is another new illustration. It's not one of the originals. Uh, I was going to mention with that butcher that when she had a new illustration, I thought I bet the reason they've given her a picture is so that they can use it when we fight her. It is the snake. It has come for you again, but then suddenly it begins to grow. The skin blisters and breaks, and, the hu and a huge winged serpent made of crystals and rocks coil up, splitting, spitting stone shards as it hisses. This must be the earth serpent itself, and I'm going to cast a flipping spell. Why would I grab it? Throw something at it? No, I cast a spell. I mean, grabbing it, I might be able to hold it off the ground. H. U. F. You craft the spell, placing your gale horn to your lips and play a clear tune. A powerful wind is summoned, striking the wings of the snake and lifting it up into the air. The serpent roars and hisses, but once off the ground, everything changes. The earth settles and the serpent itself shrinks once more to the size of a normal snake and I will absolutely murder it. You catch the creature's throat in one fist and throttle the life from it. It rattles, gasps and then hangs limp from your fist like old rope. But the earth below is still. You have now defeated five of the seven serpents. Well, technically four, because I've still got the sun serpent in a crystal bowl or glass bowl. Your weight returns and you settle gradually back down on the ground. So now my flying spell has worn off, which means I shouldn't have had my leg trapped, realistically. Gradually you shrink back down to your normal size. The rocks around are smooth and unbroken. The whole thing might have been a dream, but for the piles of stone dust that cover the ground. Well, I'll gather some of those, because they're spell components. You gather up the stone dust into your pack. Time to resume your journey. Only two more serpents remain at large. The water serpent, which I intend to defeat with the power of the sun serpent, and the time serpent, which I have yet to find a good way of defeating. Can, can I just rest now? Go back up here. I need to find myself a good resting spot. Right, so here we are. You follow the old road. More stars come out. You are following the ruined line of an ancient road. I'll look into the darkness. You pause to look either side into the darkness. To the east, a little shrine indicates the start of the waters of Lake Ilklala that you must cross to reach the Zanzunu peaks. To the south, you are hemmed in by darkness. From somewhere overheard, not overhead, something shrieks. Yeah, I probably shouldn't rest here. I'll, I'll keep on going. I'm going to be so cacked in. 
Looking northwards, you can see the northern reaches of the Zanzunu Peaks. Somewhere there lies the ruins of the ancient city of Tinpang, once filled with the Archmage's most devout followers. And when I get there, it may be a ruin no longer, because there's a beacon tower. The road curves gently as you follow it. The stars are flooding the sky. A little dust blows across the surface of the ancient road. Suddenly, you hear the sound of hoofbeats. Something is coming towards you through the darkness. The next thing you know, you are knocked flying by a low-armoured creature. It is a roach pig, and I will cast Yap. I've met... Is this... Is this looking for the one that was looking for its mother? Oh, please, that would be brilliant. Pulling out the green wig, you wear it and cast the spell. The roach pig snuffling transforms into a delicately formed speech. Indeed, it seems to recognise that you can understand it almost immediately. Well now, it purrs in an amiable voice. What manner of creature are you to be listening to an old pig like me? I am a sorcerer. A <laughs> somewhat winded, I must admit, from being knocked over, you tell it. Ah, a weaver of stars, the pig replies. We roaches cannot do it, of course. We do not have the correct appendages, but we have observed the behaviour amongst your lot. It is most remarkable, though I prefer sailing myself. Surely you cannot sail. I mean, as a human harnessed natural phenomenon, the pig explains. The marriage of wind and water resistance provides for sailing, despite it being a most unlikely combination. That's rather pleasing to an old pig like me. Do you play swindle stones? I mean, I doubt you can even roll the dice. Um, what can you tell me of the Seven Serpents? <laughs> you asked, not expecting to learn much. Well, there's one in the fissure near the lake, the pig replies casually. Oh, well, there's one in the fissure by the li near the lake, the pig replies casually. You must have come that way, so perhaps you've already met him. A horrible thing, otherwise none in Timpang, that I know of. But the lake is teeming with them, the water, the islands, they're everywhere. Which serpents are in the lake? You ask. The pig beats its lower jaw against the ground in a gesture your spell is unable to translate. Buh, buh, buh. My apologies, they did not stop to give me their names. Oh. How is life as a pig? You ask, somewhat intrigued. The pig seems to smile. Quite fascinating, he answers. We are naturally curious types, and since we cannot write or do as you can, he gestures with his trotters as he speaks, we must observe and think instead. The pig thoughtfully cleans on trotter with its tongue. Cleans one trotter with its tongue? How do I cross the lake? I don't think he can tell me much about Mampang. I don't know where he's travelled to. How do I cross the lake, you ask? The pig shrugs. I would sail, he replies firmly. Though, of course, you need a sailing boat for that. You can feel the spell beginning to fade. I'll bid the pig farewell. I'm not going to draw my sword. You take a moment to say goodbye to the pig. The creature bobs its head at you and then stumbles away down the road. You let it go. Now I think I'm going to rest. I could walk on before the night gets too desperate. This is no kind of place to rest, but the day has been long. You sit down, trying to repress a shudder. The ghosts of ancient cartwheels seem to run through you. They are ancient. I will try to sleep and hope I don't die. I've had one dangerous encounter. Hopefully that'll be all I have to put up with. You stretch out and try to sleep, ignoring the echoing wind that seems to carry fragments of voices past you. You have eaten nothing today, but there is nothing you can do to abate your hunger. Just close my eyes and try not to die. You close your eyes and let your tiredness overtake you. 
A long night is filled with vivid dreams. Once more you are falling into a pit of burning rocks, but every time you land, it is only for the stones to melt and you tumble further down. Mocking laughter seems to ring in your ears. You've lost a little gold, just one coin, reached Lake Ilklala, walked on the ancient Backlands Bridge, and you collected the Sun Serpent and the Earth Serpent, meaning there are two serpents still out there. I didn't collect the Earth Serpent, I defeated the Earth Serpent. Thank you very much. You wake. You have not been run over in the night. The road is just as it was. You continue on your journey towards Tinpang, of course. You continue to walk along the road. The early morning sun makes the air glow. The road passes between the pillars of a ruined stone gate and then opens out into a wide plaza of low ruins. I'm immediately reminded of one of the Golden Dragon game books, but I'll just carry on. I'll look at the gates. Wait. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. The pillars were maybe once carved. One is set with what looks like a jaguar, the other some kind of winged goat. Perhaps this place was once walled. But there is nothing there now. The pillars are covered in patches of covered in patches of green moss. I'll have some of that. You collect a handful of the moss. It is wet and pungent despite the arid air. I'll smell it. You put your nose into the moss and smell, but are, and are all but overwhelmed by the tangy, rank aroma of cat urine. How desperate am I here? Really desperate. Yeah. You pop the moss into your mouth and chew. A moment later you are gagging and choking. This moss is foul and disgusting, with a flavour like rotting meat. You you spit the moss on the ground. <laughs> Foul. Look at the ruins. Door frames jut from the unforgiving sands. Windows stare like dead eyes from buildings moulded into the rising cliff itself. This place must have been magnificent once, but now even the spectres must have been shredded by the wind. The silent city echoes to the sound of your footsteps on the road. You are aware you are headed away from Salmon and not towards it, but perhaps the ruins of this place will have something to aid you. Food, spell components, food, anything edible, beacon, find people, get food, buy food. We have gold, just no food. You follow the outline of a street into the first of several open plazas. It seems this was once a city hewn in vertical layers into the northern cliff face itself. Now it is as though a great clawed creature has scratched it from existence. A few dwellings remain, but most are broken piles. Only one structure remains standing, a tower that rises somewhere to the west. The air stirs a little, still cold but fresh. The foul flavour of the moss from the gate has still not quite left your mouth. I shall explore the ruins before I restore them to their former glory. Oh, bugger, I'm going to regret that, aren't I? <laughs> the ruins of the city are quite extensive. Whatever happened here, it scooped away great sections of the city as though the streets were raked by gigantic claws. The grandest houses are those near the cliff face. Further from the slope, the dwellings become smaller and less remains. A few clouds race across the sky. Okay. I've already been moved to the middle. This is like if this is like an upper class district and this is a lower class area. This this place things may be more well preserved here because there may have been better quality buildings.
You head upwards towards the cliff face, jumping over cracks in the ground and then clambering over the roof of one building into the gaping doorway of the next. Mosaics in the floor and painted walls speak of great wealth, but their patterns can no longer be discerned. I will search closely in case I find anything of use. Anything edible I find here is likely to be rotten and gone off. But growing things, like, like mushrooms or moss, much more healthy. You search every corner and look through every window and crack, but you find nothing. It seems that whoever lived here left... Whoever lived here left, they... T that when whoever lived here left, they took everything they could with them. On the highest street above the city, you find a house, perhaps the grandest so far, whose stones adored with bright red paint. I will go inside and hope nothing bad happens to me. You look inside the walls of the painted red, of the red painted house. Nothing remains, of course, just the outlines in the stone of a small room with a fire pit at the back. Something white lies in the hearth, perhaps the remains of something long since burned. I doubt it's going to be some mouldy, half-cooked bread, but it could be like, um, ashes or something. I don't know. Let's, have, let's look, right? You go over to the fireplace, and what looks at first like discarded dice turn out to be the set of teeth. You turn them over into your hands, trying to place what creature they are from. Um... I'll go with probably Snatter Cat, long and white, right? Snatter Cat? Of course! They have the curved, talon-like profile of a big cat's tooth. You have found free of what use they are. Well, I'll take them. You place them into your pack. You now have five teeth, quite a collection, and I do not know of a spell to summon them. I will continue further on and further in. You continue along the curving street until you pass a large doorway and the surprisingly intact ruins of a hall. Lying in the doorway is what looks like a massive oversized figure. Finger. I will look at it. Probably a pillar. A dead giant, perhaps? If so, you might be able to acquire a few more precious teeth to add to your collection. You follow the line of a finger inside the building along the length of an arm that disappears under a pile of rubble and stones. Kick the finger. Look, if this is some kind of wake sleeping giant and I wake it, not I, um, and it's buried under rubble, not a lot going to happen. I'll, I'll, I'll dig. You go over to the rubble and begin to haul it away. Once you have cleared a few rocks, you begin to see the first wisps of thick hair from the giant's beard underneath the stone. If he is in fact dead, he cannot have died too long ago. So he could be sleeping or unconscious. I'll keep working. You keep working, removing stones with an aim to reach the giant's lower jaw, but after removing a flat stab of stone from across his mouth, you are struck by a hot, wet blast of breath. The giant is not dead after all. He is sleeping. Can I make him depressed so that he's not going to hurt me? Right, so I'm, I don't think I want to kill him. That would be rather dishonorable, but I could cast a spell. Ha, huh, ha, huh, sharpen up my sword. <laughs> no, rock, turn him to stone. That wouldn't help for his teeth. And why should I kill this giant? I could make myself big so he thinks I'm a giant. I don't think I'd be quite his size, but how would that help? Wall. Invisible wall, yeah. A uh, walk. So this is mostly all combat spells, right? And I'm very badly hurt. Um... I could float in the air. I don't... Wait, yes. Then I could sneak away much more quietly and not wake him up, right? 
Oh shit, that that didn't work. Right, okay, fine. C can I die now, please? Um, you cast a spell, lightening your body weight to a mere fraction of normal, but your spell casting is clearly agitating the creature. Yeah, look, that messed up. Can I just um? Can I rewind, please? Yeah, just here. Look at the finger. Unbury the arm. Keep working. Creep away. There is an old adage that one should let sleeping giants lie, so you quickly move away. Your loop of the upper city is finished. The rising winds finger at your hair and cloak. I will try the lower city before the tower. You walk through the ruins of the buildings that spread across the floor of the valley. One seems to be a large warehouse, that, though whatever was stored here has been taken by the winds long ago. I'll keep exploring. You pick your way over a low wall and through the shattered outline of a family home. A vague depression in one corner indicates a f an old fire pit. Well, I'll take a look and see what I can find there. You scratch in the dirt of the fire pit for a time, but you find nothing beyond a few shards of broken pottery. You leave the old house by what was once the doorway. Scratched on the doorstep is a chiseled mark, perhaps a drawing of some kind. It could be another hint at a spell. You squat to examine the marks. They're, they were perhaps once more detailed and are almost worn away by the scouring dust. A cat... Large and striped, is curled up into a ring for warmth. That's got to be a spell. Oh, 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 yap? Do, do they mean a literal cat? I thought that was the carving. Hot and how? Not right now. Do, <laughs> yeah, you give me the D, but nothing else of a word. Sus. No. I want to understand this old carving. Um, got F. F. Ah. Okay, yeah. You sit cross-legged on the flagstones and put your palms on the orb of crystal. Reaching up to the stars, you create the magic and everything changes. Your vision is suddenly overtaken by a strange sight. Once again, all you see is the endless curling mountain path. The vision fades. The sun begins to dip, heading towards the horizon. There is nothing more to be done. You loop through another house, but find nothing. These streets have been reduced to mere marks in the dust. There are no signs left to tell what happened here, and nothing more to be discovered. Slowly, the sun begins to lower in the sky. I will pray to Korga for healing. And my prayers are answered, and then head straight for the tower. You follow the line of a broken structure until you reach the base of the tower. Somehow, amidst all the leveled buildings, its walls stand firm. Then into the tower I shall venture. The door opens easily. The inside of the tower is much like the others you have seen, except that perhaps it was once decorated. The walls are hung with rotten strings and are set with empty candle brackets. You could go up the tower or back out into the street. Well, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go up these spiral stairs and it won't let me do the proper spiral, so there we go. This tower also has a brass cylinder set into its centre with a glowing crystal at its heart. From here, the plan of the old city is quite clear, winding streets and blocks leading it towards and then up the cliff face. Though it has all been scrubbed clear, the stain of human, of the stain of human habitation still remains. I see no of. I'll look at the view. Looking out across the city, it seems you can see two time periods at once, 
one fitting on top of the other, but it is impossible to tell which is true and which is the mask. You watch a, tri a child running down a street only to turn the corner and disappear. You watch a dog springing into existence mid-leap. A building throws yellow smoke into the air and when the smoke clears the building is ruined and broken. I'll watch a little longer. You cannot tear your eyes away. Every time the streets clear or a building falls, you feel your anger towards the Archmage rising. The desolation here is complete. The people you see are both still living and already long destroyed. I will activate the ink beacon. And it sweeps into life. I shall adjust the beam. So if I, I'll go for a shorter beam, right? I can get almost all the town without having to down 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 just just, 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 just just there but first can i get it to reach for the time serpent oh time serpent beacons are focused upon you this one's not so i want the town i want all of the town. I also want to know if I can. Come on, come on, come on. Come. It's going the wrong way, going the wrong there. And back down ever so slightly there. I might be able to cover the rest of the town with another beacon. You adjust the cylinder now almost accustomed to the curious effect of the magical light. It seems to bring the dust of this dead land to life, like a sunbeam picking out motes in the darkness. You feel better for having touched the cylinder. I'm not going to touch the blue crystal. I'm going to climb down. You return down the tower steps, and I hope I will not get into trouble for walking into town here without any sort of lodgings or anything. You head off into the city once more. The sun has almost set and the sky has turned a deep purple. It will be dark soon. The streets are suddenly alive with activity. People roam the streets calling to one another and talking. Musicians stand on street corners playing lively jigs to passers-by. A nearby building pumps yellow-tinged smoke into the air. You make your way along the busy, bustling streets, marvelling at all the people. They do not realise they are ghosts, and I should not inform them of this. Their faces express the usual range of thoughts and feelings. Happiness, fear, anxiety, humour. They do not seem to realise they are no better than ghosts. But once the light from the tower is moved away, they will be long dead once more. Except they won't be, because they'll be in their own timeline. So that, the smoke... The smoking building, the high city, the main square, the eyes. I, I shall visit this, this building with its. Oh, right. I, I don't. I, I click and hold. That's how. You approach the smoking building. From inside, there comes a cacophony of sound, crashing and booming as though a rock demon was inside, fighting against its chains. I'll keep listening. This probably isn't a good place to eat and sleep. You continue to listen, making out the sound of hammering and grinding above the echoes. This building must extend backwards into the mountainside and be an enormous cavern of activity. Perhaps it is a mine. You turn about as a small boy grabs your arm. Are you supposed to be inside? he asks. I'm not supposed to be anywhere. I could say yes, but I'm going to say no. No, you tell him. I was merely passing by. The boy nods and his manner becomes cold. The mine is not open to visitors by command of the Archmage. Please move on. He bars the door of his tiny body. Well, that's totally fine. What's inside? You ask. The boy shakes his head, refusing to reply. Well, then I'll just shrug and walk away. You shrug indifferently and walk away from the building. The boy waits, watching until you have turned a corner out of sight. I'll go to the main square, where I will hopefully find somewhere to eat, drink and rest. You stop in a plaza. A woman passes by wearing a wrapped headscarf and carries what looks like a basket of rocks. Uh, greetings. Is she not allowed to talk to me because she's going for mine? 
I am new in this city. She nods quickly. Then you are welcome, I sure. She seems to be in a hurry to move on. No doubt her basket is heavy. Can I carry that for you? You ask. Most assuredly not, she exclaims. I would not be doing my work if I gave it away. She takes a wary step backwards, almost stumbling under her weight. And where do you work? You continue. At the warehouse, of course. She waves with her nose at the building with the yellow smoke. It seems like the town's entire industry is based around that building. Uh, what work do you do? You continue. I carry things, she answers briskly. I carry things. She pulls her scarf tighter. Forgive me, but I must do my work. With that, she carries away down the street and disappears. Do I not get to, to rest? Or Fine. Be like that, Venice. For the middle of the night, I, I was only... They're working in the middle of the night. You take a turn down the narrower alleys of the city, picking your way between sleeping dogs and rubbish heaps, until suddenly a tiny hand catches out at your ankle. It's not Jan Minimite, is it? Knew you were there, see? groans a voice. Tell you more if you want. Who's there? You demand. No reason you should know me. You still cannot see the speaker, but the tiny hand seems to emerge from a pile of rotting vegetables. I'll look at the pile of rotting vegetables. You look more closely and spy two eyes between cabbage leaves and goat bones. I see, you see, I see you, the voice declares cheerfully. For one gold piece, I'll tell your fortune. How's that? You know what? Sure. You toss a gold piece into the pile of garbage and the voice makes a noise that sounds like swallowing. Then all falls quiet. I will wait. There. I see it now, the voice declares finally. I see a ball of flame lit near the still sleeping cat. Yes, I've seen that. What does it mean? Oh! Hot cat. Cat hot. I have no idea, the voice replies, but understand this, I am never wrong, rarely at least. So be it. You walk away down the alley. Back to the tower. You return to the tower. As you walk, the buildings crumble, their walls caving in, sand pouring like water from doorways and filling the empty streets. One by one, the people turn corners and disappear. And I shall go inside to slumber till the morn. The gloomy shade of the tower encompasses you. Could, you, you could return up the tower or back out into the street. Can't I rest here? Well then, upstairs. Because obviously, the telescope like cinder sits on its setting. I will adjust the beam once more. I need that poor quarter to be in ruins. Also, hey, look. Yeah, you go away. You get to stay. Uh -huh. All the beacons. All the beams. You shift the brass cylinder, then step back to regard its effects. And down I go. You return down the tower steps. Back to the poor quarter looking for that carving of the cat. You leave the tower base. Darkness closes in. You need to rest, especially after so long walking with an empty belly. The silence of the city is, sudden, is a sudden shock once more. All the people you saw earlier, all have disappeared like sunlight behind a cloud. And I'm going straight back over here. You find your way back to the house, with the carving of the cat on its doorstep. It is a shattered wreck amongst shattered wrecks, more like an architect's sketch than a true building. I will hot it up. As long as I'm not, like, in the fireball. You move the constellations into shape around you, summoning a fireball in your palm. 
The firelight gleams and flickers on the old stone walls, showing up the deep crevices and scoured stones. Every wall looks as though it was scraped by long, clawed nails. The firelight also gleams off something green, trapped in a crack in a of a stone. Let's investigate that, which we apparently couldn't find about the spell. You go closer, pushing away the dirt with your fingertips to uncover a gold jewel jammed between two stones. The jewel of gold! Perhaps it fell there, here, or perhaps someone wished to hide it. I will dig it out. You set to work with your fingertips. Hey, I've got a, I've got a, I don't have a knife. I sh should have a knife, some sword or something, you know. Uh, to dig the treasure free. It's tiresome work, but eventually it comes loose. You cannot believe your eyes. The jewel is an ingot of solid, smoothly worked gold. It is likely to be both valuable and useful in spell casting. A clever find indeed. The fireball finally gutters and goes out with a pop. You move away from the building with the curved step. A little light glows in the east. Yeah, we're not allowed to sleep. Can I sleep on the road? I can't sleep at the tower, so to the road I go. Oh well. You lost another coin exploring the city of Tin Pang, and you collected the Sun Serpent. You have now defeated five of the serpents of Man Pang. Well, four and one, but yeah, sure. You leave the city for the old road. In the distance, the sun breaks over the horizon. You have been awake all night and a weaker for it. This is not a place to linger. I need to be awake when I face the water serpent. But I also need to find some kind of clue to make a little more sense out of the time serpent's weakness. And I really need food. Should I explore Tin Pang during the day? Probably, yes. The air moves a little, still icy but fresh. You move on. So, yes, I'm liking this idea. Hold on. I'm going to rewind that one. Just, just there. I'll go back into the town and to the tower, and I'll explore the town by day. The winds whistle through the broken buildings of the city. The sky is blue and pink. I'm going back to the tower. I want to see if I can get some bloody food. You make your way back to the tower, inside and up. I'll adjust the beam. Let's get the poor quarter as well. There we go. I'll climb down and explore the middle of town. You head off into the city once more. As the morning, mo morning moves on, the wind begins to rise. You walk the bustling seats half dazed by the streets, half dazed by the number of people. The factory chimney is still smoking. Can I... Please, I can't... I can't just... Okay, fine. Just here then. You follow the winding, climbing, stepped streets into the upper reaches of the city. Low hovels and clustered dwellings are replaced by larger buildings, mansions, palaces, and central offices. You pass a familiar building daubed with red paint with two doors. Well, hey. Above one door is a sign with a picture of a fanged tooth. Can I sell them? Above the other is a metal implement with, that looks like a small pair of tongs. Uh, I don't want to get any teeth ripped out. I've got some snatter cat teeth. You open the door to find it leads into a wide hall, which the other door also opens onto. On a large chair at one end sits a man with a tight-fitting leather cap. On a low table 
At his elbow rest an array of metal implements. He stands as you enter. This could be some kind of horrible mistake. Greetings, declares the merchant. Are you here to buy or sell? A strange question, since there appears to be nothing on sale, unless the goods are all behind the curtain that covers the back wall. What is your trade? You ask, puzzled. He seems surprised. You didn't see the sign? You're a dentist? He winces. That is a nasty word for it, he declares stiffly. It's as though I called you a conjurer. He shuffles a few documents on a table, on a low table by his arm. But, but do I take it then you are simply not in the market for teeth? What kinds do you sell? I have a few rarities in my possession today. A genuine Firefox tooth, two Snatcat teeth, and my prized possession, the tooth of a rock demon. Um... If I can find spells to summon a Firefox and a Rock Demon, that'd be great. Rock Demon's tooth's gonna be really expensive. I'll buy nothing. You close your pack and your money pouch. He shrugs, clearly having already marked you for not a big spender. I have something perhaps to sell, not my own. Excellent. He leans forward keenly. Your own teeth, or those of others. I have creatures' teeth to sell, not my own. I'm not even going to... He's already proved that he would buy my teeth if I sold them to him. I have creatures' teeth to sell, you tell him. And from what creature, he asks? An ape. Ape teeth? <laughs> he laughs out loud. Well now, very few people want an ape tooth, but those that do are quite obsessed with them. I believe they use them for cat burglary, but I'm not sure. I will give you 15 gold pieces for each one, or 60 for free. How many do I have? Um, I'll sell all three. I will sell all three. You take out three teeth and hand them over. The merchant whistles for a lackey who takes them into a back room and returns with 60 gold pieces. Uh, that's not 15 each, that's 20 each. What happened? Oh, I see, or 60 for free. I have some Snattercat teeth, which I will come and find here in the future. <laughs> a Snattercat. His eyes light up. A most useful tooth indeed, he exclaims, and very hard to come by. I will give you eight gold pieces per tooth. I hope that is acceptable. I have some. On the off chance that I still have the opportunity to learn a spell to summon them. Which is looking very unlikely at the moment. I have five Snattercat's teeth. I'll sell him two or three. And I am getting nothing, absolutely nothing, to spend all this money on. I will sell two. You hand over the two teeth. The lackey returns to collect them, and you are paid 16 gold pieces. And no more, he asks. No, that's, that's enough for now. No. You close your pack. I have nothing more to offer. Cast a spell... No. Oh, speaking of which, now that I have the Jewel of Gold, what spell can I cast with it? I would love to buy a medicinal potion. Where can I buy one, please? Sap. God. Ah, there we are. When this spell is cast, any creatures or humans nearby will take an immediate liking to the caster and will offer aid and information. This illusion can only be performed if the caster is wearing a jewel of gold. I don't want to con the guy. And I think there are better opportunities to cast that. But I do want to see what spells are available. <sighs> ah. You open your arms to raise a spell, but the merchant catches your arm. 
Try if you must, he says, but we have a Minimite chained up in the back room. We don't want people testing out the merchandise in the shop, you understand? Oh, I completely understand, and I will depart. There is nothing more to do here. With a final nod to the man, you return to the street. You move... I'm not going to try the other door with the tongs where they probably pull people's teeth out. The streets are quieter here, with fewer passers-by. But there are still no guards, no soldiers, no priests, no children milling around. It is as though this whole city is purely a place of workers and foremen. A mining town, perhaps. And... No opportunities to go purchase food. Back to the tower. Readjust the beam. And in I go. Obviously reminded of uh, the line from The Hobbit where Elrond speaking of... No, was it Bard? I think it's... No, not Elrond. Um, what's the name of the Elven King? I don't think it's Bard. I think it's the Elven King who ha Franduil, who doesn't have a name in The Hobbit. He gets his name in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, but speaking of Thorin in the mountain with all his piles of gold, he says, let him eat that if he will, when, they lay when we're laying siege to the mountain. I, I, am, I am wealthy in coin, not in rations and provisions. Time to adjust the beam. Do, 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 That has got to be... I need to make sure that the water serpent isn't going to get obliterated by beams. Touch the blue crystal. One, two, three, four. I need to go here. You fall at great speed. You're back in the branches of the tree. The metal cylinder sits on its track and I will adjust the beam. Now, I strongly suspect that focusing no less than four beacons, including that one, on the Time Serpent, will not defeat it at all. And I will touch the crystal again. And go across to here. And I'll climb her down. You leave the tower base. The evening is drawing in. Soon it will be dark. The streets are silent as the grave now, and I will head out of town. I shall also... If you thought I was going to say pray to Korga for healing, you were absolutely correct. We truly are a pilgrim. <laughs> Time to move onwards. Well then. Can I, can I sleep soon, game, please? The road curves gently as you follow it. Another night begins. You should find a place to sleep, especially after walking all day without eating. You march on. And now, this is not a safe place to rest because it's in the past where, where wagon wheels are dangerous. You follow the old road. The moon oozes across the top of the sky like a drop of quicksilver. The cold wind moves between the cracked flagstones. You continue to walk despite the dark, and I go to here to rest. I could go to the lake shore, but that doesn't feel very safe. Oh, there's houses down there. The road curves gently as you follow it. The bottom of the road meets the path up into the mountains here. From the south, just to the south, is a deep fissure in the land. I will slumber here if I can. Laying your pack down on the flagstones, you try to settle despite the cold. You have not yet eaten today, but your pack is empty and you cannot satisfy your belly. You lie back and try to forget your troubles. You seem guarded here and you do not dream. I have recovered a significant amount of stamina, a whole 11 points, gained a huge amount of gold, 75, explored the city of Tanpa Timpang, 
and you have collected the Sun Serpent, so you have now defeated five of the Serpents of Mampang. Two more to go. You wake. The cold wind of the steps has left your body stiff. It will be good to start walking once more, and I feel that I shall walk into the very next episode. I'm going to leave this one here. I hope you've all enjoyed this one, possibly a bit longer than usual, and I will look forward to seeing you all in the very next episode. But I'm going to say goodbye for now, though, and cheerio, everyone. Thanks for watching.